I do welcome you to worship this morning. It is Easter and it is a beautiful day. And we started our worship services yesterday with a 4.30 service. I like to remind our Saturday 4.30 service that they can feel like they are the day before Easter. But actually, if you look at your world clocks, when it's 5 o'clock in Plymouth, it is midnight in Jerusalem. So I always remind them on Easter that they are the first Easter morning service in Massachusetts, as long as we're going by Jerusalem time. Well, that also reminds us of Saturday, and this morning I'd like to think about Saturday. But also, we had another service this morning, and that was the one out in our memorial garden, and that was before the sun rose. So those of us who were hardy and got up early this morning, I went to bed nice and early last night so I could get up at 5 o'clock to do a 6 o'clock service so we could be here before sunrise. That's another time that we gathered for worship, and I'm going to talk about that. And then the third time is after the sun has come up, like all of us, where we celebrate the new day that God has given to us. When I look at the story of the resurrection, and we look at what John has recorded for us, I'm going to suggest that those three times that we had worship services also correspond to what we hear in the gospel. We think about what people were experiencing on Saturday after the crucifixion, what they were experiencing the first day of the week, Sunday morning, before the sun came up, and then what they experienced after sunrise. What they discover is they also change their focus, and that's my question to you today, where is your focus? Because people's focus on Saturday, as followers of Jesus, was all focused on themselves then they started to have an outward focus by early Sunday morning, and then the focus finally came to where it should be. And here's the problem I would like to suggest to us. Far too many Christians live as if it is Saturday, and Easter hasn't happened yet. And when we do that, we get our focus in the wrong place. We start focusing on ourselves. We start thinking about me, myself, and I, that is not the Holy Trinity. The Trinity is actually supposed to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But far too many Christians live as if life is all about me. How do I feel? What do I think? What's my perspective on things? What's my truth? That's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not how we're invited to live our lives. There's a far better way to live than to be self-focused, but I will tell you, in our world, there's an awful lot of emphasis on conditioning us to be me-focused and first-person-centric. If you don't believe it, check out social media. Do you know what social media is all about? Getting likes. How many likes do I get? Did I put something up there that makes me feel good because everybody else thinks how witty and smart and profound I am? And some people will even turn off social media. They'll say, I just don't want anything to do with Facebook. It makes me feel bad. But usually the reason they are feeling bad is because they're comparing themselves to someone else, and that's still a me focus. How do I compare to another person? I recently decided in getting ready for this message to look at the 10 most popular kinds of social media. I discovered that I actually only knew three of them. The rest of them were terms that I don't even know what they were talking about. But I did discover something about all of them. Everyone is all about the likes. It's all about how do I put something out there that other people find impressive. The problem with that is we are a black hole if we just try to constantly, narcissistically fulfill ourselves and think that somehow we can make a difference in this world if only the world would become more conformed to our image. Well, I suggest that on Saturday, when the crucifixion of our Savior had taken place, there's very little written in the Gospels about what takes place, but people were very much on Saturday in their own heads, overthinking it. Do we have any overthinkers in our congregation today? Come on, let's put our hands nice and high. You know what I mean by overthinking. I can't believe I followed him these last three years. Hmm. 
I trusted him. He was the Messiah. I saw him do these amazing things. Wow. And now look what's happened. They killed him. What am I going to do now? What am I going to make out of it? How am I going to explain this to all of my friends who already thought I was crazy for following this guy, and now he's gone? I like to think that on Saturday morning when the crucifixion had taken place, the men were all depressed and laying in bed, didn't even want to get out of bed. Then they were mad at their wives because their wives weren't in a good mood getting up and cooking breakfast for them. My, how things don't change, do they? We think about ourselves, we think about our needs, we think about our wants, we think about what's in it for me. And then I imagine a guy who is a follower of Jesus. Now, I can do anything I want with this guy because I made him up. He's my own creation from this last week. You won't find him in the Bible because I made him up. He probably doesn't really exist. But in my mind, he does because I thought about him. And I thought there could have been a guy who started following Jesus. And he started listening to his teachings, and he started seeing the miracles. And he watched as everybody was following, and he learned to trust him. He listened to this guy, Jesus, who said he was the Messiah. And he believed him, and he put his faith in him. And he started to give up everything. He wasn't one of the inner group. He wasn't one of the disciples, but he was still one of the ones around them. And when the crowds would gather, he was there. When the Crowds would go small. He would still be there. And he probably, this guy, was watching the day that they crucified Jesus like the other men. Not like the women who were there close by, but he was watching from a distance trying to figure it all out. And then my guy, who I made up, and I can do anything I want with him because he's my story. He's living in Jerusalem, and it's Saturday, and he's an overthinker. And he thinks about it all, and he starts going to his head, going, I cannot believe what's happened. I didn't see this coming. I can't believe that I spent all this time following him. But no, I really do trust him. No, I don't know how to explain it to other people. And he just starts ruminating over his head. And as he's walking down the street, he's so focused on himself that all of a sudden, bam, a chariot hits him. And now my fictitious first century follower of Jesus is dead. And he's ushered into heaven. And he's standing in heaven, and an angel comes to him and says, Welcome to heaven. And the guy goes, I don't get it. What just happened? And the angel said, You followed the Messiah. You listened to him. You trusted him. You believed him. He died on the cross for you. Congratulations. He paid the price for you. And the guy goes, oh, this is amazing news. I can't wait to do something about it and go tell everybody else. And the angel says, sorry. You were so narcissistic thinking about yourself that your life is over. There's nothing you can do. But you can enjoy heaven. That's the problem with being me-centered. Salvation still happens. My getting focused totally on me, doesn't negate what Jesus did for me. It just takes a lot of the work that God has for me to do away from you and me able to do it. The truth is, the followers of Jesus focusing on themselves didn't change what God did. They just didn't understand it yet. They were just thinking about it themselves and feeling bad about it and wondering what was coming next. And like good 21st century Americans, they were so focused on themselves that they were missing all the good stuff that was happening around them. Now, if we don't see it with my guy who got hit by a chariot, think about if you were a Buffalo Bills fan. This guy is going to connect the resurrection to the Buffalo Bills. Try that one, Pastor Stan. First of all, do we have any Buffalo Bills fans here in the congregation? Hold your hands up high because I'm about to offend you. Sorry, I did it on Saturday too. (laughs) But don't worry. I grew up in North Dakota. I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan. We are kindred spirits, the only two football teams that have gone to the Super Bowl four times and lost four times. So what happens? Can't believe my team. They're just going to blow it anyhow. They're never really going to win at all. That's what I've heard from some of my Buffalo Bills fans who are friends of mine, just like the Vikings fans. You know, they can get close, but it really 
we're Buffalo. We really never win at all. So now for my favorite Buffalo Bills fan, again, my fictitious woman this time, who I pick up. She's given tickets in 1993 to the wild card game, January 3rd. She gets to take her whole family to see a home game, the first game in the playoffs against the Houston Oilers. Now, earlier in the year, my Buffalo Bills fans all knew that they had played Houston and they lost. Go check it out. They lost 27 to 3. And so what happened that day in the first round of the playoffs, typical Buffalo experience, they were down 28 to 3 at halftime. So what happens. Minnesota Vikings too. Check it out this year. I'm cheering and I'm going, finally going to happen. The Vikings are going to play the Bills in the, in the Super Bowl and we're going to see one of them win and they both lost before they got there. So now you're down 28 to 3 at halftime. But remember, you're the Buffalo Bills. Great things don't happen to the Buffalo Bills. Jim Kelly gets injured in your game. That's what happened. Star quarterback. Eventually, he became a super, a, um, made it to the Hall of Fame. If that wasn't bad enough, the best defensive player, Cornelius Bennett, also got injured. And at halftime, it was determined that Thurman Tom Thomas couldn't play. So now you're sitting there watching the game, and you're down 28-3. to three. But there's always a second half, right? Well, in the second half, the backup quarterback, Frank Reich, throws an interception one minute and 41 seconds into the game. He actually throws a good pass, bounces off somebody else, it gets caught, and the other team runs it in for a touchdown. So now, congratulations, good old Buffalo Bill fans. Typical, down 35-3. to three. You know what happens. People start to leave the game. People get frustrated. People think about their own thoughts. Oh, there we go again. I can't believe it. It always happens this way. All the good Buffalo Bills fans not only started booing, they started saying, I knew it. And when many of them left, congratulations, they just missed the greatest comeback in the history of the NFL. The game is called the comeback because Buffalo went on to win the game 41-38 in overtime. You see what happens? My thoughts don't change the reality of what's happening around me. I like to think they do. My thinking, I can figure it out in my head, doesn't change the reality of what God is doing or even what the Buffalo Bills are going to do on a football field. But my thoughts get in my head and start becoming my reality, and that's what happened to the disciples and the followers of Jesus and even the women on Saturday, and far too many Christians, hear me loud and clear, live as if we're Saturday Christians. We have it figured out. We know what's wrong. We see all the problems out there, and we focus on ourselves, which then takes us to early in the morning, Sunday morning. Before sunrise, all of a sudden, a miracle takes place, the first of many in the resurrection story, because the focus went away from everybody focused on me, myself, and I to focused on you. If you listen to the text that I had read a few minutes ago, you'll see that Mary Magdalene moves away from thinking about herself to start thinking, how can I do something for someone else? Here, when we move away from being me-focused to being you-focused, we start making progress in our faith. Amen? Yeah. I'm going to say that again. When we move away from being me-focused to you-focused, we start making progress in our faith. Amen? Yeah. Let me tell you why. Because when I'm just focused on me... I'm a really dark hole, and I can go to that squirrel cage in my head, and I can miss all the stuff that God is doing. When I can get myself in those places to start doing something for someone else, a miracle can take place because I'm no longer just focused on myself. Listen to verses 1 and 2 before sunrise, early Sunday morning, while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Yes, early before sunrise, Mary Magdalene is the first person in the Gospels 
who changed her focus from herself, from me, to you. She all of a sudden thought, I can do something for Jesus. He may not be here, but I can still do something for another person. Time to anoint the body. No more thinking about herself. Her focus actually changed far before the text tells us at the moment where she got up in the morning and started to get ready and started to put the spices and the oils together. Whatever moment she started to do that, that is the moment where she got out of herself and started saying, I'm going to do something for someone else. She did another second person thing in the text, if you listened. When she found that the stone had been rolled away and she didn't know what was going on, she immediately thought, this is no longer about me. I need to go tell another person. She goes and she gets Peter and she goes and gets John and she goes and talks to others because no longer is Mary Magdalene focused on herself. Standing outside the tomb at those times when we're trying to understand what's going on, but we're just confused. That's okay, folks. That's okay, folks. That's part of our faith journey. There are times in our life we do not have the answers. And if we act like, oh, I have all the answers, then we're missing what the gospel's telling us. Mary Magdalene didn't stand up that day and say, let me tell the rest of the world what you all have to believe. She's confused. But she's thinking of someone else. She's not thinking about herself. She's not thinking about her feelings. She's not thinking about what raw deals she got in her life. She's thinking, how can I help another person? She's so confused that she's weeping. Four times the text says that she's weeping. Have you ever been there? I know God's there. I trust him. He's in my life. I've given my life to Jesus. But things don't make sense. I don't have it all figured out. So I know what I will do. I'll get myself busy and I'm going to help another person. We tell people that all the time. That is the best advice that anybody can give to you and to me when our lives are not making sense and we can't figure it out. We're not going to go deeper in our thoughts. That's not going to help us. But we can do something for another person. Amen? Amen. We can help our family. We can help our neighbor. We can come to church and we can help serve the homeless in our community. Getting outside of ourselves gets us moving forward. It's sort of like the person or three-quarters of the congregation that comes on Sunday morning and says, I can't believe what a boring, irrelevant sermon Pastor Stan preached this week. (laughs) It made no sense to me. And we go home and we tell our family, I can't believe it. They pay that guy to deliver that stuff. I'd do better if I checked out a YouTube channel. But then the next week we go again and then we come home and we complain again. He did it again, 0 for 2, 0 for 3, 0 for 4, and we keep complaining because we just really never like and aren't really getting anything out of it. And we're like, I guess other people are because they're showing up. Must just be him, not me, obviously. But there's something that's not making sense. And then one morning, the person wakes up and their family says, what are you doing? And they say, I'm going to church. Well, why? Every week you just come home and tell me the guy can't preach. I'm not going for that. I'm going to encourage other people. I'm going to go there because everybody else needs me to be there to encourage them. Guess what, folks? That's legitimate. If the only reason you go to church on a Sunday morning is to go to encourage someone else, that is perfectly fine. You see, in our faith progression, we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have it all figured out. We can learn to just simply walk forward by faith, and when we don't know what to do, do something for someone else. Trust me, it will make a difference. Now imagine our Buffalo Bills. Remember our game there where they're getting ready to get beat and everybody's booing them and people are walking out? Imagine that person who got those tickets sat there and said, I'm not going to boo them. They're my team. I'm going to stay here and cheer them on. I am going to encourage them. Hear the difference? When you think of someone else, a miracle is going to happen. Hear that? When we can move our faith away from me, myself, and I to thinking of others, now God has stuff to work with in our lives. And that's how we're supposed to live our faith. But it doesn't end there, let me tell you. But it is certainly an essential part of our life. 
I have two boys. You usually only see one of them on Sunday because the other one is a little bit far away. I'd like him to come to church, but he lives near Cleveland. It's kind of a long commute. And he discovered that when he went away to college. Because growing up, our youngest son always thought he was going to go to college around here in Massachusetts. And then it became apparent that he was going to attend a college in Berea, Ohio, and that's quite a ways away. And when Todd first got to college, he really struggled. He had a tough time. It's hard to go away that far from home when you're a kid. Now he's in Ohio, and he calls me up on the phone. He goes, Dad, I can't do it. What can't you do? I can't stay in college. Why? It's just too hard. Well, then come home. You can't do that either, Dad. Why can't you do that? Well, then I'd be a loser. So you can't stay away. Nope. And you can't come home. Nope. You're not giving me a lot of options here to work with, son, are you? He goes, now you see my problem. (laughs) Todd, I said, go to church. Go to church. Why should I go to church? Todd, it's what I always advise everyone. Go to church. Find a church. You'll feel better. Well, I'm an introvert. I don't like going into a big place. I'll never make friends. Then go to a campus ministry. What do you mean? There's campus ministries on your college. Go to a campus ministry. So then he asked me a question. He says, okay, I will do that if you do something for me. How about if you call the campus ministry on the phone and tell them that you have a student at this college, Baldwin Wallace in Ohio, that you're a pastor in Massachusetts and you want them to watch out for me when I get there so somebody will talk to me. I said, okay. He said, but one thing, don't tell them you're my dad. I said, what? He said, call the campus ministry. Just tell them that you're a student from your church. He said, I've heard you do it for others. Do it for me. I said, okay, I'll do it. At which point I made the weirdest phone call I've ever made in my life. (laughs) Hi, is this Campus Crusade for Christ? Yes. I'm a pastor in Massachusetts. Where? Plymouth. Okay. I have a student at your college. His name is Todd Cushing. And he's going to come to your meeting next Tuesday. Awesome. What's your name? Stan. What's your last name? <laughs> As I was saying, this student, yeah, well, what, who are you? I'm his pastor. What's your name? I'm, I'm Pastor Stan from Massachusetts. This kid is going to be coming to school. I did get away with it, but man, did it go strange. <laughs> Tuesday night, 9 p.m., Todd walks into a crew meeting, and there's Josiah. Josiah is a young man from Ohio who said, and I quote him, I saw a little lost puppy from Massachusetts walk through the doors, and we became friends. They're still best friends to today. I also discovered that the church did exactly what the church should do. They discovered that he played guitar, and they made him a guitar player in their worship team. And now Todd's going to crew, not because he's necessarily getting something out of it, But he has to be there because they need him there because they want him to play guitar. And next thing I know, he calls me and he goes, I'm trying out for a worship team. Really? Yeah, there's a big mega church down the road and I'm going to play in their worship band. I go, wow, really? He goes, yeah, pray for me. The the tryout is next Monday. And he got into a worship band for a large church. Why are you doing that, Todd? They need me. Hear what happens, folks? When we can move away from me to you, We start becoming like the gospel story. We start being like Mary Magdalene. When everybody else was still consumed with their own thoughts, she started to say, how can I think of someone else? But here's the thing. God won't leave you there when you start doing that. Because now we're starting to get active in our faith. We still don't have it figured out. If you went to Mary Magdalene and said, would you like to explain to me the seven theories of the atonement? She'd go, huh, I don't know what you're talking about. But you know what she did know? She trusted in Jesus. She'd seen him die. She was thinking of others. And she knew that God was bigger than her problems. And that's sometimes the only place where we're at. But when we do that, we discover that God honors our faith, even while we struggle, as long as we're thinking about others, which gets us to sunrise. Because we go from a focus on me, myself, and I, to you, to him. Our eyes are now not on ourselves or someone else. They're on our Savior. John 20, verses 14 to 16. 
Now Mary Magdalene turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener. So, sir, she said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you put him that I might go with him. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned and she cried, Rabboni, which in Hebrew means teacher. Mary Magdalene turned to leave and saw someone standing there. She saw him. Because that's who our focus is on. The whole thing of Easter is to get us away from ourselves so we can start thinking of others, that we don't have all the answers, but we start discovering it's about him who gave his life for you and for me and is an unconditional person in every aspect of your life. You see, life is not about living first person, even though social media is going to tell you it is. And in reality, life isn't just about the other person. Because I got secret for you. The people that you love, they're as screwed up as you are. You hear me loud and clear? You're not going to be able to just serve another person and get all your needs in life met because they're not going to be appreciative enough. They're not going to see the things that you do. They're still going to be unkind. They're still going to be unforgiving. And they still have the same problem that you and I have. And so if the only thing we can do in our faith is move from me to doing for others, we still aren't there. God has something far better in our lives. And that's when we learn to have abundant life the life that God wants for us, when no longer do we think we have to do it on our own, but we discover that there's one who did it for us. That no matter what is going on in our life, unconditional love and grace is being extended by one who doesn't have a need, who did come because he's God incarnate in the flesh, and no matter what's happening in your life, you can pour out your life to him and focus on him, and he will take care of your needs and my needs. He just won't always do it the way we want because no longer is a focus on me. No longer is a focus on others. I start realizing that the resurrected Christ is the one in whom I trust. Now, I've shared this before, but one of my favorite things to do is watch those really cheesy Christian movies. I love them. People say they have such bad acting. I say, I love the bad acting. They say, but they have the same actors over and over. I said, I love the same actors and actresses over and over. I like to see them get older and gain weight. <laughs> I like to see them going from good people to bad people, going from one movie to another. It's so much fun. And one of my favorite that Regina and I just rewatched for umpteen however many times is called Fireproof. Do I have any Fireproof fans in our congregation? If you haven't watched it, do yourself a favor. If you think the acting is bad, I told you it was bad. It's supposed to be bad. It's a Christian movie after all. It's the message. It's not millions of dollars. It's a story of Caleb and Catherine. Their marriage has fallen apart. And Caleb is a firefighter, and he is willing to rescue and put his life on the line for everybody else, but not his wife. And we just start seeing in the movie is two people who are focused on themselves and their relationship has completely fallen apart. Because you know what happens when our relationship is all about me? It's really hard to have a relationship with somebody else. And so we get introduced to this couple, and we sit and we watch them on the screen, and we go, I can solve your problem if one of you would just start thinking of the other person. Things could start getting better, but they don't. They just go from bad to worse. And then one day, Caleb's father comes and drives a few hours to meet with him and says, son, I'm watching what's going on in your marriage, and I've got something for you. And he sends him a journal, and for 40 days... Caleb is asked to do nothing but think about his wife. Get it? First person, second person. No longer thinking about me. Now we're going to think about the other person. So every day, reluctantly, Caleb does something kind and nice for his wife, like leaves her flowers that she takes and throws away because there must be some ulterior motive here. Because they have a really messed up relationship. But every day, he just faithfully thinks about her and thinks about her, and then he's asked to pray for her, and by the end of the 40 days, his heart's been changed. Because doing something for the other person has made him realize he really genuinely does love her. But the problem is, she's not been doing any of the same kind of stuff. And so now you still have a messed up marriage until finally some things happen that she starts thinking about him. 
But here's the thing. I don't like Hallmark movies. Got that? Do I have any Hallmark movie fans in the house? Tell me your Hallmark movies. I don't know any of them. I don't watch them. Because that's a Hallmark movie, right? You just go from a problem to where each other's fix? No. This is a Christian movie. Because we know in the end, if all I can do is think about the other person and expect that other person to reciprocate, we still have that sin problem there, and it's not really going to work out. But what we discover with Christ, and they are Christian movies, is then the two people, Catherine and Caleb, give their life to Christ and redo their marriage as a Christian marriage, and no longer are focused on themselves or even the problems with each other, but they start realizing that there is one who unconditionally loves both of them, who has a plan and a purpose for their lives. Amen. Folks, that's the Easter message. To quit focusing on me. To learn to think about other people. And to get to the point where I realize, in the end, it's about him. It's about the cross. It's about the one who died for you and died for me, who no matter what is going on in your life, if you were the last person on this earth who had ever done anything wrong and everybody else was perfect, he would have given his life for you because that's God's unconditional love. We mess it up because we try to add to it. We think we know better, and so we make it about ourselves. Or we think we must add to it, and we make it about ourselves. The truth is, there is nothing that my guy who got hit by a chariot, remember him? We talked about him earlier in my message. There's nothing that he did to deserve the grace that was given to him. Yes, he had his eyes focused on himself, and he missed opportunities to be used by God and to make the world a better place and to share Christ's love with others. But it wasn't about him in the end anyhow. It was about Jesus. And it's not just Easter. It's every day of our life. We are invited to go from Saturday to sunrise. If you're stuck in yourself, and all you can think about is yourself, we invite you to come forward for prayer. If you've gotten to the point where your life is about some faith that you have, but you're really still trying to make somebody else happy or do something that somehow is going to convince somebody else for something, and you think that somehow that that's going to solve all the problems in your life or your marriage or your workplace or anyone else, we also invite you to come forward for prayer. And if you'd like to make Jesus the focus of your life, to give your life to him, to know that no one loves you the way your Savior loves you, we also invite you to come forward for prayer. We're going to have members of our elder board please come forward. And if anybody would like to come for prayer during this last service, this last song, we invite you forward at this time. And let us stand together as we sing.